and we will get going. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ins and outs of advising at Plymouth State. Uh, Kelsey Donnelly and I are going to take you through some advising ideas and stuff. Um, this is a pretty informal, it will feel a little formal because I have to share screen with a PowerPoint, but this really is an informal presentation where we want to be able to answer your questions and uh, go in directions that are useful to you. So please, as we're going forward, don't hesitate to just unmute and ask questions or interrupt or whatever you want. Tanya has already promised some heckling. Uh, so we are we are here and excited for that. Um, so now I'll go to the sharing the screen portion. And someone else is in the meeting room. Nope, oh, first I go, oh, great, Sarah's here. Um, so I won't really be able to see, see the chat while I'm sharing the screen. That's just what I wanted to, to warn you of. Okay, so. I'm assuming everyone can see our advising at PSU uh, slide. If not, let us know. Also, if volume gets bad, please just jump in and let us know. It can be a little weird with the owl, owl here. Um, I think usually Kelsey and I are fine, but sometimes if there are people around, um, hearing can be a challenge. So just let us know. Okay, so we're gonna begin with our, hey, night, um, with our reg registration process. So maybe quickly, I'll just introduce oh, yes. myself. Introduction. I, I know there's some new names yes. on there. So I am Kelsey Donnelly. I am the Assistant Director of Advising. I work in the Academic and Career Advising Center. Um, I work closely with Matt, also on the Advising Task Force together. So in addition to advising all day, I just, I love talking about advising. So that is what prompts this awesome session to happen every year. And I'm uh, Matt Cheney, and I am Director of Interdisciplinary Studies, which is a program that does a lot of advising because we have students from across the university. Um, I've ended up on the advising task force since it was created about 7,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, Leslie was there at the beginning, weren't you? Mm -hmm. um, and has continued on, and now it's part of the Academic Affairs Committee, which I have also somehow ended up as chair of. So lots of advising stuff. And Kelsey and I uh, and Tanya and others do lots of work together on the rethinking and thinking advising here at Plymouth. Um, so the registration process is, we used to call it the new one, but we don't anymore because we've been through it for at least a year, I think. Um, and it, this is how it works. So uh, Kelsey, why don't you? So the reason why we changed it, we used to have it so students had a registration day. Um, there was one week of registration and students would have a specific day that they could register on. Many students missed that deadline and didn't register when they were supposed to. They just didn't have like this sense of urgency to get it done or like do it like a week before classes. That made it difficult, um, one, for advisors who have to constantly track down those students to get them registered for classes, two, for course like scheduling purposes, like we need to know how many sections of things we need. So actually, I believe Tanya um, proposed this option because it was at an institution that she used to work at. And it's worked really well, actually. So how it works now is that we have two weeks of registration. So in the beginning, like pre-reg advising starts next week, October 17th, which happens to be Matt's birthday. Happy birthday, Matt. <laughs> Everything is happening on the 17th this year. It's very bizarre. So pre-reg advising goes from October 17th to October 28th. That's two four weeks of pre-reg advising. And then Registration opens up on October 31st, but it's not for everybody. October 31st, that Monday, is um, specialized registration for one students that are, well, I'll go into this in a minute, um, who, who registers on during the week. Um, so the first week is October 31st. Um, registration opens Monday, September 28th for undergraduate continuing ed, and then undergraduate degrees, degrees thinking students register the following schedule based on credit. So I think the next slide really helps what I'm trying to jumble in the words here. <laughs> so Monday, October 31st, 7 a.m. is when students on with presidents and dean's lists will register if they have 60 or more credits. So they get to register first on that Monday, as well as uh, students with campus accessibility services. 
who utilizes those services, they have that priority registration day as well. Come Tuesday, again, students with 60 or more credits, everybody else can register. So they have from Tuesday to Friday to register for their classes. At the end of that week, it stops and they are not able to register the following week. So you really want to make sure your advisees know that if they have that first week, they want to register for those classes within that week and it ends at 4.30 on Friday. Um, then the next group of students, so students with under 60 credits can go. Again, that's athletes in the current season, presidents and deans list from spring 22 grades. And, and that's it for that Monday. And then Tuesday, everybody else with 60, with less than 60 can register. The caveat with this, it, it's not, it doesn't include courses that you're currently registered in. So that's something that we really want to make students know. It's 60 earned, like you have to have completed those courses. Yes, the earned credits um, question is one that comes up from students a lot. Um, and yes, and Jeff has just asked in chat if the slides will be shared, and they will. We're going to have them up on our uh, uh, resource page on the CoLab site, which will be uh, coming to you via email and is also on our website. So this really helped with getting students to register during their time. It, it has it has been a like noticeable difference. Like we in our office, when we had such heavy caseloads, we realized this was helpful. Yeah. Same with us here in, in IDS. It can be annoying to students because their registration turns off after their week um, for a little while, but uh, it really is helpful in, in creating that sense of urgency. And so though there's two weeks of pre-reg advising for everybody, those students that have six, less than 60, you technically have three weeks to advise them. Right. So that's helpful too for those of us. With a lot. <laughs> Um, then on November 14th through 18th, registration is closed for everybody. Um, and this is what we've taken to calling problem solving week. Uh, and it also has been a big help because some things you discover during registration week as students go to register and they discover they have a hold on their account, for instance, or students who just never respond and, and uh, you have to go searching for them. Um, so this problem solving week allows us to, to figure out any of the stuff that went wrong um, in the previous two registration weeks. And, and registration is closed for everybody to keep it fair um, so that nobody gets ahead of anybody else as we're trying to solve problems. Then it opens up again the week after and stays open until add drop into the next uh, semester. All right, so the, the kind of advising we've been talking about in recent years is holistic advising. There is and has been traditionally at colleges an idea of advising is essentially telling students what courses to take, and that's about it. But um, throughout the country, really, a lot has changed um, to moving toward a more holistic view on a purely useful level, in that one of the things that we want to do is make it easier for our students to succeed. And if we are able to pay attention to some of the things that create obstacles in their lives, then we are better able to help them succeed in our classes. Um, so we've been thinking about holistic advising at Plymouth is advising that, ex that examines all aspects of the student's life, not just their academic uh, journey. So what's affecting their health? What's affecting their career aspirations and explorations? Now we've, we've brought uh, advising and career development together in uh, in one office, essentially. You all can talk about that better than I can because you're living it. Um, but realizing that advising and career concerns, especially for students in this day and age, are really united. Um, all of the challenges and successes of their lives, all the things that they're involved in or not involved in, we'll share some uh, resources for, for helping students discover clubs and, and organizations that they might be interested in. Um, so this allows the advisor to become something of a referral agent. It's not that, that the university expects us to know everything. I don't think anybody in even advising feels like you know everything, um, but rather having a sense of who to ask and, and where to help direct students so that they can have a kind of one-stop person, that a student doesn't have to remember 10 different people to ask all sorts of different things of, but rather they can go to their advisor and problem solve together. 
um, thus helping to build confidence, help build offering encouragement, building relationships, and really helping to develop that sense of belonging that we all know is what allows students to be successful at Plymouth State. What have I missed, Kelsey? No, that was really good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll go with that. Let me take this. Sure. One. So keep the students in the loop. It is really important, something we've realized, to let your students know who you are as advisors early and often. How can they, like right from the beginning, even prior to them coming, I think it's important that students know like who you are, how you can help them, how they can get in contact with you, like what's your, like do you prefer text, email, where is your office? I think just letting students know where to find you should a problem arise is really helpful. And that's not about us saying you have to do it this way. I think a lot of faculty will, will bristle at the idea of having to have, you know, you must to give uh, your office hours to students via text or something. Um, instead, it's about helping the student understand how you communicate best and how they can communicate best um, with you. And every advisor is a little bit different than that. And it's not about you know one way of doing it. It's about being transparent with students, making sure that they know how to contact you. Yeah, and how they can set up appointments. I know our office uses Navigate. Many offices use bookings. It, whatever works for you, just ensure that the student knows that you're accessible, you're willing to help, and how they can find you. Yep. And so some conversation starters. I'll turn this over to Kelsey because you're the master of these. I love conversation starters. I start each class with one when I'm teaching in there. It's always great. So I, I think it's just my way of digging a little deeper. When I have a student sitting in my office yes i want to make sure the issue they came in for was taken care of whether we need to adjust classes or whatever but i also like to dig a little deeper these are some questions that i frequently ask um how how is your world how are classes i really want to ask are you behind in any classes are you missing any classes how are things going with your roommate are you eating you would be surprised how much information I get from the question, are you eating? And it's not something typically you would think to ask, but so many students are, no, I'm not eating. No, I can't eat the food here. No, like that eating question is a big one, I've realized. Um, my favorite one that I ask a lot is on a scale from one to 10, what's your experience at PSU so far? And I'll get a ranter, it's usually an eight. <laughs> And I follow up with what would make it a 10. And that really hones in on what isn't feeling right. So then we can make adjustments. A lot of the times students will say, well, I'm just not meeting anyone. I'm staying in my room. And that prompts me to know like, all right, let's go take a look at the orgs, the organizations and the clubs, because right there, you already know you have similar interests. You're going to meet meeting people that are like you. That first step is done. So Again, we do show that link later on, but we might that might prompt me to get them in contact with the counseling center or some tutoring services. So it's you know it's just, and that question is useful even with students who've been here for a little while. You can say, "How's your semester going?" One through ten, quick quick snapshot. Yeah, um, and you can really get once you open up that opportunity to talk, um, that can be such a help. Yeah, I think students come in like expecting not expecting to build a relationship, expecting you them to check off a box. Okay, I met with my advisor. Okay, they're going to help me fill out this form. I don't think they're expecting to build like these solid relationships with their advisor. But once you dig deeper, the conversations do start flowing and you do end up building relationships. But sometimes stuff is way beyond our ability to help. Uh, and there are resources for that. Uh, so, for instance, there is the care form, which um, lots of people use a lot of time, and it really sets a process in motion. There is a, a care team who uh, monitors these forms that go through Frost House and David Zare's office. Um, you fill out the form for any academic or social concerns, really any concerns of any type that you have about a student. Um, and there are different levels of care form. You can indicate whether this is an emergency, whether there's a threat to life, et cetera or just um, a student's been missing lots of classes. So this is one way to really help other people um, get involved in, uh, in helping a student. I've also found that reaching out just to David Zare 
um, can be useful too, especially if I'm like, I don't know if this is quite care form level or, but I also don't know quite what to do and I'm worried about this student. I will often just email David and he's really good at getting back um, about student concerns uh, and sort of helping you problem. He's a great one to problem solve with too. Um, he's got lots of experience. Um, you can also use Navigate. Navigate has a whole alert system. That's what we use for our three-week alerts. Um, and But you can use alerts whenever you want. Um, and that's a great way if you just want the student to know and you want the advisor to yourself, in this case, um, to know. Um, but it's also a way of keeping a record So uh, because alerts are, are saved within the system. Um, and you can also encourage students to in, uh, contact the Counseling Center. The Counseling Center has lots of resources, not just one-on-one -on -one appointments. They have lots of, of different um, ways that they can help students and, and confidentially. And then we have involvement in uh, clubs and organizations and also career opportunities. Yeah, this is a, a big one, and I'm sure it comes up in all of your advising meetings, but like, what are your career goals? That's another great conversation starter, just to dig a little deeper about what their future goals are, not so much what's happening today, but where do they want to take uh, the experiences that they're using? So that's a common question I ask. My <laughs> resume example I put up there, that's basically how I explain to students why it's important to get involved. I say, so in four years, you're going to be graduating from PSU and your degree is in psychology. So you're going to be graduating from a degree in psychology. And then someone next to you who's also graduating at the same time and applying for the same job has a degree in psychology and a minor in criminal justice. And then there's a third person also graduated from PSU with a degree in psychology, a minor in criminal justice, but this person has studied abroad and has participated in multiple clubs and shared this committee. Which one are you as an employer going to bring in as to interview? So padding your resume now is always a good thing. That's just a baseline career conversation I have with students when they have met with us and they don't know how to get involved. Again, going back to them needing to make some connections. We, I open up this list of clubs and orgs. It is really low risk. It is like you click a button, you say, I want to I want some more information about this club and they will email you the time of the club, um, when, you know, who's the president. They'll send you more information, but it's not like you have to go find someone. It's pretty, it's a really easy reach out. We'll have, we'll show you a resource in a moment that's available through my Plymouth that has all these links on it as well. So you don't have to feel like you have to write down a whole long book there. Yes. And, and minors is on here. Again, we always recommend using your gen ed or your elective credits to go towards a minor. It does help um, when you're applying for jobs. It's just another credential that you can get. Study away. There's the link for that. Lunch buddies. That's something I learned yesterday. Back to the connection piece. If students are recognizing that they haven't necessarily found a group of people that they feel like they can connect with, on Fridays, there's a group of students that meet in the hub and walk over to Prospect together. So that is a way to keep people from having to eat on their own. And we put the link to that too, because I think it's a great program. A lot of students, especially in the beginning, that is one of the things that rise to the surface. I'm not meeting anybody. So. And if you don't know a lot of people, Prospect Hall can be really intimidating. <laughs> you know, it's this big the cafeteria. Uh, and so the Lunch Buddies program is a great way to, to work with that. We actually did a survey uh, a couple of years ago to any student that landed on like warning, probation, or separation. The number one thing that all students had in common was no one got involved. It was 100% across the board. No one got involved. So I mean, that could have just been a strange coincidence, but it was pretty telling. Mm -hmm. One of the things students may talk with you with as an advisor is changing their major. Uh, I see this a lot because in interdisciplinary studies, the majority of students who come to us did not first choose interdisciplinary studies. Um, and then students also discover that interdisciplinary studies is not for them. Uh, so supporting students who want to change the major is really important. And it's important at Plymouth State. We make changing your major pretty easy here. It's a simple form. Um, and so we want to encourage students not to feel trapped in a major. This can be hard when we're sort of fighting for major numbers and such, 
Um, but that's a problem for us, not for the students. So it's, students are not going to be successful if they don't enjoy um, or feel successful within their major. So we do like to support them in changing. So please support students as in their decision to change. Talk them through that. Where is the problem lying? It may just be a small personality conflict with a teacher or something that can be dealt with within a major, but it may be an overall shift in interests, shift in goals. Um, do they have an idea of what major they want or are they just discontented with the one they're currently in? Um, there are lots of people you can direct them toward to talk about new majors um, and the program coordinators of each major are probably the best if they want to explore. Um, do they know what their, their options are? You can look through the catalog. The majors are nicely listed through the catalog and they can look through in all the various uh, descriptions and the program requirements. Um, you can direct them to us here in interdisciplinary studies. We're happy to talk with students who are thinking about changing major, um, whether it's to IDS or to another. We've gotten pretty good at knowing what the majors are on campus because we mix and match with them all the time. Um, send them over here to the collab. Um, the major process is very simple. Uh, it's a um, it's a form that's on the registrar's website. It's not currently an online form. One day when ETS addresses all 400 issues on our list to them, we will get to that, we hope. Um, but it's just a simple PDF. Um, what did I miss? I'm going over that. I guess just I put email templates, so I probably should just explain that. Outlook, Microsoft Outlook has this cool function called templates. And I send change of major emails all the time. And I got smart and decided not to rewrite the same message over and over and over. And I utilize the template function in email. So now I just go to template, hit change of major, and it automatically populates with my change of major. And I include who they need to contact, some information on how to fill it out, um, and how to get it sent to the registrar's office once they obtain the signatures. The other thing I wanted to say is about intro classes in programs. You can encourage students to explore um, a major through intro classes, but don't bank on a course being called intro as being the best one for them. You might want to reach out to the program coordinator to say, what would you recommend an exploring major to take? Because they're, the majority of intro classes are fine for that, but there are some programs, our interdisciplinary studies included, where the intro class is really for declared majors solid majors um, and, the, and it may be a different class that's a better one for for students to explore with and this isn't on the slide but it should be we have a resource called what can i do with this major so as students are yeah. looking to explore other majors they can you know the search bar on my clinic if you just type in what can i do with this major a resource that we have here on campus pops up and you can do a deeper dive onto all of the majors most of the majors not all of them um, just to see a little more information about what actual professions you can do with those credentials. I have a question. Sure. Um, so one, I guess a comment first. Thank you for sharing that resource. That's a common one that we've had in career development that I think is really important because I would anticipate sometimes students are wanting to change major because they may not know all of the pathways and options that they could pursue with their major. Um, but what are the kind of most common reasons students are wanting to change major? Do we have any core themes or kind of consistent themes we're seeing? The most common one I get is it's not what they expected, that they picked it usually when they came in thinking it was one thing, it wasn't that, or they didn't pay attention to one element of it. We get adventure ed students a lot who forgot that it has the word education in it. <laughs> um, they love the adventure part, the education wasn't for them. Um, that sort of thing, or they just grow. You know, it's a time of life when a lot is changing for you. Um, you jump on something that your guidance counselor in high school told you was a good fit, uh, and you give it a try, and it really wasn't. Um, lots of different possibilities. Okay, helping students with having academic difficulty. This is what we're good at. This is where we're from. The academic side of stuff is what we as advisors love. Um, so, have the students who are having academic difficulty, this can be a hugely valuable portion of your advising time. Um, first, we have a couple of ways to know when students are in academic difficulty if they don't happen to tell us. Um, one is so looking at the three week alerts that everybody gets. Um, these are relatively new. We're still learning how to work with them, um, but they have been anecdotally pretty successful in, in helping students avoid that point where they get to six week grades and go, what do you mean I have an F? I thought I had an A. 
um, or worse, <laughs> later on at the end of the term, a week before, going, what do you mean I have to do lots more work you know, in order to pass? Um, same with six-week grades. Uh, these are both ways of giving us information to the giving information to the students, giving information to us as, as advisors. Um, and you can book appointments with students through Navigate um, or encourage them to, to use whatever service you prefer for making appointments with you um, to talk about what's going, what's not going well for them and strategize around that. Um, is there something else going on? A lot of the times when students are not doing well in a class, it's, it may not be because they uh, don't understand the material or can't. Um, do the work, it may be because there is something else in life that is an obstacle. I had a student who was not attending my class, and this seemed weird to me because they were really seemed to be a, a, a capable student, and they were not getting up for this 8 a.m. course, um, which I understood, but still, they can get to class. So I reached out to them and said, what's going on? Why are you missing class? And they said, thank you. Nobody else has reached out to me. I'm working 50 hours a week, and I just keep sleeping through my alarm. I said, well, OK, we can, we can do what we can with that. I can't fix that you're working 50 hours a week, and you need to do that to be able to pay for school. But we can come up with some other strategies and maybe adjust some things for you um, if you're willing. And it, and it worked out. They did not have the greatest term ever, but we were able to figure out a way for them to pass the course, which was really the most important thing. Um, can you meet with students who are in, in academic jeopardy, particularly um, weekly or biweekly, just as a check-in, even if they just jump onto Zoom for five minutes and say, having a good week, <laughs> um, as a way for them to have something regular um, and, and something to expect. It's good for accountability. So sometimes yeah, they accountability. need that. Um, there are also, you know, half semester courses. So if they have to withdraw from a course, if something's going terribly, um, we'll talk about some financial implications of withdrawals at, later on, but half semester courses exist um, and they're a great thing for students to sign up for. They can do it right now. Um, we have a bunch of things. Art of sketching has been hugely popular this term as a half term course. Um, and also Becky Noel started a career um, exploration course that I think is going to be great. I have Cluster Learning Springboard, which is open to everybody. It's a fun project based course, not stressful at all. So if students have had trouble with one course, need to drop it, but don't want to lose credits, want to keep going, um, half semester courses can be a great way forward. There are also some composition marks, I think, aren't there? Oh, Tanya's got her hand up. Tanya, jump right in. Hi, sorry for interrupting. I just wanted to chime in about the second half classes. Um, similar to the earned credits piece that people, and it's not just students who don't understand this, there are a lot of other folks on campus that don't understand earned means completed and graded. Um, the second half courses, to Matt's point, if a student is looking to get out of, um, whether it be you know, a first half class, first um, full semester class, whatever, at this point, students are withdrawing from those classes. They are not dropping them with, with no you know, transcript notation or whatnot. What's key here, is that the withdrawal means the student gets a W on their transcript and they're still paying for that class. It still counts in their overall credit um, load for attempts. Unfortunately, there are folks out on campus who are advising their students that they will be quote unquote dropping and they should just be able to add in this second half class for no extra charge. And that is not true. All of the courses the student takes that are not dropped, dropped, meaning they just go away, factor into the totals. So if a student is sitting at 16 credits and they withdraw from a course to pick up a second half, and that second half is a three credit course, they're going to be paying for a one credit overload. So I just wanted to make sure that folks understand that um, because and then recently, because this is the time of the year that we're at, the registrar's office has been seeing quite a few of those oopsies where the student has either been told or advised or presumed um, that this would just be a wash and it's not. It is above if they're adding a second class to their already full load um, that they have currently, whether it's a withdrawn course or not. Thanks, yep. Matt. Yep. Thank you, Tanya. Can I yeah. ask a follow-up yeah. question? Um, to the um, half semester courses, and Tanya, this would probably be, I think, for you to answer. 
um, so I'm thinking ahead to spring. Um, I actually teach a second half um, course. Why um, does our second half start two weeks after the first half of the semester starts? Right, and that's only in spring, right? I believe so. Yeah. Oh, boy. Sure. All right. How much time do you have? Open, <laughs> open the can. can. Okay, I guess I open the can. So, very, very, very long story short, um, a couple of years ago, there was a hoopla around spring break that the courses that ended and started around spring break um, weren't appreciated. So with the help of the provost's office, we changed the first half, second half to a first seven weeks, last seven weeks, so that everybody could have spring break off and there wouldn't be that overlap. Um, so that's how that came about. And we didn't feel that it was appropriate to have one seven week and one eight week or one eight week and one seven week. So we just said, we're gonna go with two sevens and now everybody gets that time off, um, students and faculty wise. Staff, we're still here. <laughs> we're still here. We're always here. <laughs> Excellent. So this is a perfect segue. Thank you, Tanya, um, because there are financial implications of withdrawals and such. And one of the things faculty will often say is, as an advisor, I, how can I know all the financial stuff? Most of that is confidential. And you're absolutely right. A lot of times the best move is simply to refer students to student financial services. Um, but there are a few things we can know. Um, so as Tanya said, if you drop after the ad drop date, that's a withdrawal. So yeah, Kelsey, so you're good at explaining. It does. <laughs> So I'm basically going to repeat what Tanya just said, but yeah. that's never bad. It, it, this is such a key point, it's <laughs> worth repeating. I jumped in too soon. It's okay. You it's just okay. anticipated where we were going. <laughs> so if you, if a student does withdraw from a class after the ad, ad drop, it's called a withdrawal. Um, there is a form they have to complete and submit to the registrar's office. So it's an official process. Uh, when they withdraw from a course on your transcript shows a W, which means that they have attempted the course, they've paid for the course, but they haven't completed the course. An F actually has the same impact. It shows that you attempted a course, you paid for a course, but you failed the course. The F impacts your GPA more. So if a student, if one of your advisees you know is not going to pass a class. They've had those conversations with the professor and they both determined that it might be best to withdraw from this course. Um, then we encourage them to withdraw. And that way, like the F would impact their GPA, the W doesn't. But if they do that, though they've attempted, say, 16 credits, 15 credits, um, we do encourage them to pick up a second half course if they can to help make up some of those credits because, as you know, you have to have average 15 credits every semester in order to graduate on time in order to get that 120 credits at, four, in, at the end of four years. But those half semester courses can be tricky. If a student has attempted 15 credits and they withdraw from one, they can add a second half but it can only be on top of the 15 credits. So they could technically only take a three um, credit course before they go into overload. There is an overload form, students can sign off, off and they can pay that extra money for that credit over. So if they decide if they're at 15 credits and they wanna take a four credit half semester course, they could pay for that one credit overload. We always try to avoid that if possible. So if a student's at 16, that's why these two credit courses have been so helpful because students can still get some extra credits but not go over that 18. Another key point and something that I only learned through end up doing this work was about satisfactory academic progress. And this is this comes really from financial aid in the federal government um, is that students have to be demonstrated to maintain their financial aid, students have to be demonstrating satisfactory academic progress. You know the details of this better than I do, Kelsey. Yeah, so um, the federal government is loaning students money in order to complete their degree, but they want to make sure that the students are actually completing the degree that they're lending the money for or else their money isn't going towards an end result. So they, students need to prove that they are completing 67% of the classes that they attempt. 
So if they withdraw or fail multiple classes, then they're not meeting that threshold. And then they fall under like it's what's called SAP. And you have to appeal in order to keep your financial aid. It's not guaranteed, but there is a process that they complete in the summer. You, they do it once a year. It's not at the end of each semester. It's at the end of the year, uh, ac academic year, sorry. Um, students complete an appeal letter saying what led to them being in this situation, what they're going to do about it. They have to create a three semester plan of the classes that they're going to take. An advisor has to sign off on it. There's some other information that they have to include. And they do follow up with students to make sure that they are meeting those stipulations that they said they would. Uh, and then finally, one thing uh, that is worth people knowing about is at, we base first year, sophomore, junior, senior, not so much on years, which students will often say, I've been here four years, I'm a senior, I have 45 credits. <laughs> um, we really base it on credits. Uh, and this is important for a few different things such as taking uh, graduate courses. So undergraduates can take up to uh, six credits of graduate courses with instructor permission once they have earned 90 credits. So things like that, it's important to, to keep in mind um, for students. Okay, so quickly moving forward so we can get to some questions and stuff. Degree Works, our friend. So Degree Works will help you and your, your students really understand where they are at in their progress here. So there are a few different places to find it. It's relatively easy for students now, I think, on the new registration system where they sign in. Um, Degree Works is right there for, um, for us as faculty, if you don't have it bookmarked, um, which I which I did long ago, and so I've forgotten how to find it regularly, but it is now available through the advising tab at the top of my Plymouth, along with a bunch of other stuff we'll talk about in a moment. Um, yeah, so if you want to just take, I, we did put the Go link to Degree Works right now. So if you wanted to take that and bookmark it, that's probably right now the easiest way to find it. You can find it through the advisor, um, not tab, but the advisor link in my Plymouth. If you go to advisor and it goes to the like search place to find your advisees, if you log into an advisee account, you can see degree works on the left hand side, but you still have to like search for the student. So I know Sarah, <laughs> Sarah chimed in yesterday. She was at this meeting. She was able to do a really great quick overview. We use degree works and transcripts like they go hand in hand. What's on degree works is on the transcripts. Um, there is an amazing what if feature mm -hmm. on degree works that we use frequently if students are considering changing their major. Um, they just want to see where classes would lie if they did that. Uh, it It's really useful. We use it quite often. It does show minors now, which is new. So that is a really great enhancement. That's the great. Um, Sarah told us that if you right click on degree works and hit duplicate, you can actually open multiple tabs. So you can be working with multiple students at one time, which actually I do have multiple students, especially during pre-reg advising. I'll have multiple students coming in and it's nice to like just get ready for those advising meetings ahead of time. Yeah, that's a feature of Chrome. It might be in Firefox and Safari, I don't know, but in Chrome, you can duplicate a tab uh, and that's a degree works looks fine with that. The other thing to note just for the registrar's office sake is a lot of what's in degree works is hand coded. So there will be mistakes. Um, just, just let them know uh, and be, be patient because it is a remarkable amount of, of hand work that has been done by the registrar's office on uh, people's degree works. Um, so you will find occasional spelling mistakes or something not counted for something that you expect, which is a, another good reason to go over students' degree works with them and make sure what's there is what they expect to be there. It can be a great conversation. We'll come back to tricks, I think, later as we open up to discussions and all. Um, another good question is how to get to the registration system, because this is different for students and faculty. Um, we don't have access to the same uh, view as students do. So there are a couple of things here um, through the registration system. That whole pathway is, is listed there. Um, what do yeah. we, <laughs> that pretty much is. Yeah, this is um, just, um, we've gotten the questions a lot recently how do we get to the registration system um, banner did an upgrade so it changed a little so i just typed out the step-by-step -step instructions on how to find the banner registration system 
and it, it's the same registration system. It's just a slightly different pathway to get there. One thing I do with students often is I will have them, if they have their laptop with them or if we're on Zoom, I have them share their screen um, to see what they're looking at and sort of go through it, have them do it because they're the ones who need to do it. Um, but I will look over their shoulder and that's a, that's a way to see exactly what they're seeing. That's a really good point. Advisors don't have access to this. That, that tends to be an issue sometimes because like we, you know, we're like, we know the system. I do work with a lot of students, so I'm watching them. But advisors don't necessarily know how to use it. So as I'll show a resource in a little bit on step-by-step -step instructions on how the student uses it. Um, so you can share that with your student if you don't know 100% how to use it. An academic planner is coming. It's in, we, we tested it out some this summer. This is a program through EAB Navigate that will allow students to plan ahead and also register for courses. It's pretty slick when it works. Um, we ran into some some glitches this summer, so now we think those are mostly fixed. So we're but we're just moving it out into a couple of programs to have them kind of play test it uh, and see uh, get some of the bugs out. Okay, here's another big question that is coming up: is how do you find students' pins? So your advisee is this has changed in the upgrade to Banner Nine. Um, please don't blame the registrar's office; they had nothing to do with this. It's all Banner. Um, so. Finding pins for students now is through um, the advisor section um, and the, the instructions are there. Um, Kelsey's <laughs> folks are also sending out a list to advisors. Yeah, I need to follow up with Sharon on that. But there are, so the, the search feature is a bit wonky. Um, if you have to make sure you hit the radio button for name, if you wanna search for name, and it is pretty sensitive. So in order to find a student, you do have to put in their last name, comma, first name. If you just put in their last name, it's fine, but you can't scroll down very far. So it really helps if you have their first name as well. And again, it's last name, comma, first name. Um, and once you find your student, you click on it and then hit view profile. When their profile pops up on the upper right-hand corner, um, you'll see registration notices. And there at the bottom, you will be able to see the registration pin. Those come out Friday, they get launched. Similarly, how do you quick, handle... just a oh, quick note, ahead, if I can, please. Sorry, um, the upgrade for Banner was is challenging. I shouldn't say was. We're still in the challenging portion of it. Um, and to Matt's point, it's Banner, and we're kind of along for the ride. Um, but I just wanted to mention, um, Kelsey, you you stated that the registration notices section. That section, I think, for me anyway. Um, kind of alleviate some of the crazy with this upgrade because everything's all in one place and it's easier to see everything for a particular student, like their holds and whatnot, everything's in one place. So we are hoping that the days of, I didn't know, nobody told me that I had a hold are long gone um, because that is one of the biggest things we hear about during registration is that nobody told them they had a hold and why can't they register? So having everything in that registration block will hopefully um, reduce some of those concerns going forward. And it does have a lot of information on that view profile. On that profile, it has their classes, it has their contact information on the tabs on the side. Like you really can get a lot of information all in one spot. So I definitely appreciate that. Uh, good question in the chat from Jeff. He says, when he clicks on degree works in the student profile, it says, I don't have permissions. Is this normal? Tanya's on. <laughs> yeah, so for some reason, we haven't been able to click the link. You have to copy the link and paste it into the browser. I'm not sure why. I do know IT is working on it, but that's the only way we found that we can get into degree works is if, one, you go into a student's profile and click the degree works there, or you put the go link in the search bar. Yeah. Okay, so also finding advisee lists. Um, there are ways in Navi Navigate, it's pretty easy um, to find it, but you can also use Banner um, through the advisor section of the services menu. Um, and you have to put in a few filters because otherwise you'll see especially for those of us who's been here a little while, a, a very long list of every advisee you have ever had in the history of your time at Plymouth. Um, so thankfully we've discovered some filters um, to bring up just your current advisees and, and that image there shows you what those filters are. 
Yeah, otherwise, when you hit um, view my advisees, it shows all advisees that you've ever been with, attached with. So you could have a fair number of students, but we found that when we apply these filters, so if the first filter you put student status equals active, and then you have to hit add to add another line. You put, make sure you select primary advisor so you get your students um, is true. And then the advisor type does not equal past. So you just don't want to pull those past students. And if you apply these filters, you do get an accurate, accurate representative representation of your advisory list. So another banner fun piece on that is they just presume that you want to know everybody from the dawn of time. So PSU also had a policy prior to 2017-ish that we didn't end the advisor relationship when students left, withdraw, um, or graduated, or disappeared. Um, but we now do that. So I'm in the midst of attempting to clean up about 30,000 records with IT um, to the, so that you don't have to do the first step of this. Um, we're in the ending stages, I hope, of the testing so that anybody who is inactive from this point forward, whenever we're given the go-ahead, will no longer show on these lists. The next piece, however, because we have to do this in stages, is the second, um, the past advisor piece, Kelsey, that you have on the screenshot. We, again, would need to go through and try to figure out how to if possible, get Banner to do that automatically because a normal person would say, I don't want inactive students and I don't want my past advisees because they're not mine anymore. Whereas Banner goes the other direction completely and says, you want everybody all the time, which is not true. So we're working on it and um, it's just another one of those upgrade things. Thanks, Karen. All right, so these are just some quick uh, advising hacks and things. I think actually we'll I'll hold off on talking about these because when we move into the advising. Yep, we're actually going to we'll, show we'll you. We'll show these. you all of this. <laughs> um, so um, one great thing is uh, Kelsey offers advisor drop-ins. If you have any questions, any concerns, or if you want to talk about the joys of advising, she is there for you. Um, on Wednesdays, Wednesday mornings, 8.30 to 9.30, either in person or on Zoom. But if the dime doesn't work for you, um, feel free to reach out to her um, and she can help. I'm going to switch sharing screen now, though, to um, first find this, to our mindfulness tab. Um, if I can figure out where I put it. Okay, so in Mindfulness, at the top, you will see there is now a tab that says advising. And this leads to all sorts of good stuff. So we use this a lot in the summer uh, for some quick, we've identified like some issues and we were able to quickly give a place where advisors and students could go to fix that. So we were, getting comments like students want an easier list of directions courses um so actually scroll down just a little bit more so this is where we were able to put like if students were looking for open directions courses they could just click on one button and see the description of the courses and the ones that were open because it's through course search and it was active this was really really helpful with summer advising same with composition and cwp because they had course descriptions each class was different it just made it so in Banner, you have to click on each class. Um, this way, it was just a quick scroll. This is also we where we have quickly posted where there are open second half classes. So those ones we mentioned earlier, you can find just by clicking that as long as they're still open and there's seats. But what we've really been building out is the faculty and staff advisor resources. Anything, most things that we use as advisors, there is a quick reference to here. 
we're still building it. There's still many more resources we want to add. Um, anything regarding Navigate, you can see there on the right, some general advisor resources on the left. I'll go into that in a second. Um, but uh, common forms we use, we just link to the registrar's office. Major minor certificate resources. On the forms to change a major, declare a minor, they have to get signed by the program, by the program coordinators. So we have a link to the program coordinators, which is on the Academic Affair website. So we can see who needs to sign those major forms. Then we found it was different for some minors. So we also have a list of coordinators who need to sign the minors form. Ultimately, it's a goal to have those links on the forms themselves. Uh, so students and faculty could like use those quickly right from there. But for now, we just did a quick resource. And then, so that form I mentioned earlier, the course registration instructions on how you can tell students how to go in to register. It's right there. Um, here you can get some quick tips up top, how to open degree work, how to log into the registration system, how to look up composition, how to look up tackling like problems, how to look up major required courses. That's something I need to build out. <laughs> how to look up connections and directions, how to look up one credit PE, how to drop or remove classes, how to find your schedule. Varsity athletes have, they need to go in and add that one credit that they get for um, being in season. So just helpful how-to guide. We do have videos on this as a resource as well. They are slightly updated, but we have a, someone working on giving updated information. Content's the same, it's just some dates will be different. So the, I've left them on there now, the videos just to show. So yes, actually. I love this. this is one of my favorite things here. So, so I've been using this for a couple years. This advising OneNote. I'm obsessed with OneNote. <laughs> I really feel like I should be getting a kickback from how many times I tell people that they should use OneNote. But every time, you know how I said I just found myself responding to emails the same thing over and over, and I'd have to go look the information up. Well, I just created a resource like the, all of the context information that I could ever need is right there on that tab. These are input templates I use if a student wants to declare a major, go through the withdrawal process. I, I, they're all mine, but you obviously could just tailor them to yours, but I thought I'd share them because they are really helpful. Same with text. I've ended up saving all my texts that I send because in Navigate, you only have 130 characters and it doesn't let you go above that. So you have to get pretty strategic with your messages that you text out to students. So I've just started saving them. I do notice that my engagement with students, are it's so much better when I send them a text. I'll send emails and get nothing. I send a quick text just to check in, how are things going? And I get swamped with responses. So if you haven't incorporated texting and wanna give it a try, you can do it right from Navigate and I can help walk you through that. It's something you want to explore. So how to, this is how do you get to degree works? Um, how do you find your schedule? How do you find your books? Basically those common questions students ask, it's on here. Like that's also where you'll find, I think the GPA calculator, quick, how do you find your books? How do you ask out of varsity credit? How do you get to clubs and orgs? Easy GPA, cost per credit. I link to SFS and then, you know, which are all information. Again, the videos that I was talking about, those are here actually. Yeah, it's a lot of the stuff that we were talking about is sort of has a home here. So this is a, a wonderful resource for all sorts of different stuff. Why don't we move to questions now though? Because we are low on time. So we've covered a ton of stuff. And don't worry if there are things you want to go into more de depth on or anything, just schedule time with Kelsey. Um, there's lots of opportunity. But what um, questions or thoughts should we address now? Thank you, Tanya, for the support. There's so much information. It's hard to boil it down to one hour. I was awfully low on the heckling, though. I got to work on that. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get you ready for next time. Yes, please. 
I was coming up with quick responses in my head and I'll have to share yeah. them with you later. Okay. <laughs> I have a quick question. Um, just about scheduling. Hi. Um, Hi, sir. <laughs> um, I was just wondering um, if it's, you know, in terms of, you know, I'm going to sort of try to schedule appointments over the next couple of weeks with all my advisees. And I'm just wondering what, it, what, it, how do you all use, like, what scheduling tool do you use? Should we, like, do you prefer that we use EAB to schedule those appointments or can we use a different, um, like, Google Calendar or, um, like, do those appointments need to sort of be logged um, so that, like, three years from now, someone can sort of look back and look, you know, follow along that type of thing? Or can we use our own, like I said, Google Calendar or what do you all prefer? Because I'm new. Yeah. So whatever I do this semester is what I'm going to do, like, for the next 20 years. <laughs> You can certainly use what, whatever works for you. I would say a couple of things about that. Um, Navigate is pretty easy. Um, I find it's once you get oriented to Navigate, Navigate becomes easy. There's sort of a little bit of a learning curve of just like, what is this thing? Um, that's a relatively easy way to go, and it does log it really well. Um, we in the, the collab, we use Microsoft Bookings, which is available to us as a Microsoft campus, um, and that works pretty well for what, what we do. Um, logging is a good thing to keep in mind simply because of some things that I know Nate has said that he's thinking about. It's useful for him to know, for instance, how many advisees you have and how many you're, how often you're meeting with them and that sort of thing. Not in a sort of like surveilling you, making sure you're doing your job thing, but rather for him to be able to share information about how much work our faculty do um, with advising, uh, because that's good stuff for, for parents to know, for the legislature to know, et cetera. Um, so it's good information to have if you want to capture that data. Um, but I think the most important tool is the one that, that you are going to be most comfortable and consistent with. Uh, Kelsey, may have a different view. I concur. I, of course, we advocate for Navigate as much as we can because it's the advising platform we've chosen. But do what works for you. Then, honestly, if you wanted to use Navigate and you're not really sure how to get started, I'd love to help out, get it yeah. up and running for you. Maybe I'll make an appointment. I have class during your open session, so maybe I'll make a different appointment time. That's perfect. Okay. Yeah, two things I think are good separate sessions are Navigate and DegreeWorks. Um, sort of figuring your way around DegreeWorks and how to use that is a great uh, other session we should probably do at some point. Um, and Navigate, we do do sessions of that on um, university days and Jam Jam and stuff. Yeah. Other thoughts and questions in our last minute or so? I, I just wanted to say thank you and just to give you a heads up that I will likely be reaching out to outside of those posted hours, the open hours right now. I think for me, um, it's really about when the students walk in and say, okay, what do I need to take? So if somebody could like share a screen at some point and go through like, here's the student sitting in front of you, this is what their, you know, banner and all, you know, because I've been looking at those things and pulling them, but it's not super easy to tell exactly where everything is. So um, just to give you a heads up, that's really the area that I, you know, I'm looking for some assistance on. That's great. And actually, um, Carla in our office has been working really hard to create registration sheets for each major um, that's broken down by semester to help with exactly what you were just saying. They are really in draft form right now. We haven't completed like reviewing them, but I can definitely show you where they are. There, you can find them and you can review and use them for your registration if you want. That is, um, if you went to, you know how we chose um, faculty or advisor, we hit advising tab and then we hit the advisor one. If you hit the one for students, you can find those registration sheets. Okay. Another thing to do is also with, because a lot of that is very program specific, Certainly, it's easy for us to help with gen ed and with students starting out, but a lot gets program specific. So I would also highly recommend asking someone in your um, program if you can sort of shadow them in advising or if they're willing to do a, a kind of role playing session with you in advising, just to see sort of how people who have experience of it within your specific program go through, because um, there's so many individual program details that, that can get overwhelming. Definitely. Great. Thank you. Okay, well, that brings us to time. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming here. The recording of this session will be available on um, the Colab website soon-ish, once Zoom processes it, as well as all the slides and, and um, 
the whole slide deck will be up there on the CoLab website for you too. All right, well, thank you, Kelsey. Thanks thank for joining you, us. Thank you, everyone. Um, this was a great session. I'll hang out for as long as people want to chat, but we'll end the recording here.